You're listening to the Dirt Pass Sermon Podcast, the podcast for the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene. I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, aka the Dirt Path Pastor, and my team and I strive to share the message of God's Word with you, seasoned with grace, laced with truth, and applying to your everyday life. Path Pastor here, Jason Barnett, um, saying welcome to year five of the Dirt Pastor Men podcast. I can't believe it's been five years already. And uh, to start off this new season, we're going to be looking at a prayer that many of us as believers have prayed. Uh, it's a go-to prayer that we have when there's someone we care about, someone that we love, someone that we interact with. Uh, when we know that they're away from the Lord, when they're on the outside of faith, we go to this prayer hoping that Jesus would open their eyes. And that prayer is, God, would you would you rescue them? Would you open their eyes to you by any means necessary? It's a dangerous prayer, but it's one that Pastor Nicole is going to look at in her message today. And perhaps the by any means doesn't necessarily apply to the person we're praying for. Perhaps what, what God wants to do by the any means necessary is get our attention to help him reach them. Um, If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, Before I get into this, I kind of wanted to share a little bit. Um, My my family discovered Netflix. It was still when they were sending the discs in the mail. I don't know if they still do that, but now everything's streaming. But I remember my dad was really excited because he could introduce us kids to all of these good old shows. We watched Gilligan's Island, Hogan's, or uh, Mikhail's Navy, uh, The Rifleman. But my favorite, my favorite show to watch with my parents was Hogan's Heroes. Amen. <laughs> Great show. Um, for those of you who don't know, particularly you younger folks who've never watched it, um, this show is about a prison camp uh, in World War II called Stalag 13. It's a Nazi prison camp, and um, so a bunch of Allied troops are being held there. Uh, now, according to the German side of things, this prison camp had one of the best records of never losing a prisoner. But on the Allied side, that was the prison you wanted to be sent to because that was how you escaped. Basically, Colonel Hogan, he's the Allied Troop CO. He is, he oversees a bunch of these prisoners and he is helping, or he and his fellow prisoners are helping other people come into the camp and then sneak out. And by, and in doing, um, one of the ways that they do this is, Sometimes they'll hide one of their own prisoners, so that way the the number's just the right amount of people, so the census is right, until this person is out, and then they'll they'll come back out and be like, okay, yeah, you know, I've always been here. Um, But that way the census is always right. So really, you kind of get the sense that throughout this whole show, The prisoners that are at Stalag 13 could, at any point, escape. They're really pretty free. Just, they look like they're in captivity. They, but they, you know, they've got the dogs trained, the guards that are on duty, like, they pretty much turn a blind eye because they don't want to get in trouble when they see the prisoners do stuff, so they just pretend that they don't know anything. And... I know nothing, <laughs> but uh, but they instead of using their ability to escape, they instead help other people find the freedom that they are needing. 
So as we keep that in mind, we're going to dig into 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 19. It says, For since I am free from all, I, from all, I can make myself a slave to all in order to gain even more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to gain the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to gain those under the law. To those free from the law, I became like one free from the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under, Christ, uh, but under the law of Christ, to gain those free from the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to gain the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all means I might save some. I do all these things because of the gospel, so that I can be a participant in it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, as we're digging into this, I I kind of feel a little bit of conviction on myself. Um, We in the American church are very blessed and sometimes a little too spoiled in that in that capacity where we we tout our freedom in the face of others i mean how often do we say well you know i have freedom of speech so i can say whatever i want and not get in trouble we use we use our freedom of speech to to berate other people to talk down to other people to to talk down about other people in their faith, other people in their politics, other people in their denomination. We don't, we are excited about our freedom of speech. But in the process, we use it to hurt others. I can't tell you how many times I've looked back and I've thought about the things that I've said to my friends, the people that I, I've claimed to love and care about, but they're people that didn't know Jesus, and I was talking down to them like they were nothing. I insulted them, and I hurt them. But Paul says here that because I am free, I can make myself a slave to all. That doesn't just mean, you know, keeping my mouth shut. That means showing respect to these other people in my life that may not know Jesus. Being free means allowing ourselves to become submissive to the needs of others. But how often do we do that? Paul goes on and he says, To the Jews, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to gain the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one of those under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to gain those under the law. We often think about the world as as a lawless place, people that have no moral compass and everything. But in reality, there are people that have very strong beliefs and and ideas of right and wrong that we might not agree with. I I think about this one um, instance where it was shortly after we moved to Kentucky, I met this, this young lady and I added, we added each other as a friend on face, or as friends on Facebook. And uh, she was, I didn't realize it at the time, but she was a very hardcore vegan. Um, well, Jason had just grilled something, and you know how he takes pictures. If you've seen his Facebook, like if he makes something really good, he takes a picture and he posts it. Well, it was really good, so I shared it, and I was bragging on this meal. Um, 
But two hours later, this girl gets on to Facebook, and I see that she's posted a rant about how disgusting it is that people would dare post meat as, you know, because, like, to her, eating meat was morally wrong. Any meat. And I was like, oh, no. I knew that she wasn't a Christian, and I was, and she had even mentioned in her post that the, that the post she had seen was somebody she knew to be very religious. And she was like, I, I just can't see how you can see that that is a good thing to do, that that's honoring to your God. And, um, and I was, so I was like, I felt a little conviction there, and I was like, you know, what kind of witness am I being? So I, I took down the post, and I sent her a message, and I was just like, hey, I am so sorry if that offended you. I do not want to be somebody who comes between you and God. And she, she responded, she's like, actually, I didn't see your post at all. <laughs> um, she's like, actually, it happened, like, there was somebody, he had posted a, a hunting picture, and it was like him with a beheaded deer in his picture, and, and it was just really gruesome, and I... And so it just, it, it hit me. And I was like, okay, I get that. And, and of course, you know, when I first saw her post, my first reaction was like, you know, yeah, meat tastes good, you know, whatever. Like, but, I, but my second response was, I need to be Jesus to her in this moment and, and love her and, and show her the love of Jesus. And so when I took down the post, you know, and I shared that with her, but I looked at the post that, later and I happened to see who she was referring to and they had responded the way that I initially wanted to respond and I was just like oh no (laughs) that that poor young lady is being shown a Jesus that is not the Jesus that we are taught about in scripture I mean does does he care if we eat meat no but he cares about how we care about others and, that, and flaunting our freedom in the face of somebody who has such a strong moral conviction, but they don't have the freedom that is in Christ, it's devastating to a soul that is seeking. So when we, become, when, when we come in contact with somebody who's like that, this, this verse is referring to those with a strict moral compass, but... They don't have Jesus. That, that young lady, she had a very strict moral compass about, about being a vegan. She did not believe that eating meat was something that was a, a God-honoring thing to do, a good thing to do, a right thing to do. And so, in, you know, I exercised my freedom by allowing myself to take down the post and apologize. (laughs) Not to be like, oh yeah, well, you're a vegan and you're wrong and, you know, God doesn't care because he cares about how I treat her, whether I agree with her dietary restrictions or not. (laughs) But to those who are free from the law, to those who are free from that strict moral compass, I become like one free from the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under the law of Christ, to gain those free from the law. It's a very dangerous thing to express our freedom in a way that that acts as though we are not free from God's law. We are still required to, to, as Christians, to follow the law of God. But what is the law of God? Jesus, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On on these two hangs all of the law and the prophets. 
So, to those free from the law, I become as one free from the law, but I'm not going to necessarily treat people the way that they might treat people. I, I, um, I think about like those instances where we might be in our workplace and somebody's berating our boss or, or another employee or, or their spouse. Or, you know, we, we hear our neighbors ranting and raving about other people around them and complaining and, and using slurs. And, and, but we are not free from God's law. Therefore, we are so called to love our neighbors. So we are, do not take part in that. We do not conti- berate other people. We do not... Um, take part in insulting our boss. We do not take part in, in insulting another employee or, or their spouses or our spouse as much as we might want to occasionally. <laughs> we are not free from God's law. We are under the law of Christ, and as such, we treat that person with respect, but we respect others as well. We don't, we don't give admission or um, permission for that behavior. We don't affirm that behavior. We do not affirm the sin that's around us. But that person needs Jesus. That person needs to find the freedom that is in Jesus. And so we use our freedom to bite our tongue and not take part and to instead show them a better way. To the weak... I became weak in order to gain the weak. Paul is referring to people who do not know Jesus. The word weak is actually used as an antithesis of salvation and and Christian piety. So it's the people who do not know Jesus, and it's the people who do not have the law of Christ in their life. To the weak... I become weak in order to gain the weak. In other words, I'm not saying that I am putting my salvation on hold or or that I am not saved anymore in order to gain the weak. I am instead going to understand where they are, right where they are. I'm going to go to them, love them where they are, and find a way to relate. Find a way to care about them. Find a way to, to minister to them in their current situation. They're, they are lacking a relationship with Christ, and they are living outside of the law of God. That is the weak. I become all things to all people so that by all means I may save some. I do all of these things because of the gospel so that I can be a participant in it. I have become all things. To the weak, I have become weak. To the strict, I have become strict. To those free from the law, I become free from the law. And it's not to say that we're two-faced. That's not what it's saying. It is saying that I am willing to put aside my freedom in Christ and my even my convictions a little, like, put, it, put them aside to recognize that this person needs Jesus. And I'm not going to 
go out of my way to try to mold them into who I am. Instead, I am allowing God to mold me into who he needs me to be to reach the person that is lost, that is right in front of me. I do all these things because of the gospel so that I can be a participant in it. So that I can be a participant in it. Jesus is the gospel. It's not me. I, I just, I'm just an instrument. The instrument doesn't play the master. The master plays the instrument. But far too often, far too often, we prioritize our own preferences when it comes to living out the gospel for other people. And I'm, I'm saying this more about myself than anyone else here because <laughs> I used to think that people had to clean their lives up before they could come to church. People had to clean or to, to, get, to get their lives right with God before they themselves could be right with God. That they had to fit a certain mold. I remember the first time I saw a Christian smoking, I was appalled. I was downright appalled, and I flat out doubted their salvation right then and there. Then I saw my youth pastor drinking, and oh my goodness, that that just knocked the socks off of me. Like, I was... it. You don't drink it. You can't drink and be a Christian. You can't smoke and be a Christian. And then, as I grew, I I became friends with this young lady who she was a new believer, and and but prior to accepting Christ in, as her Lord and Savior, she was living with her boyfriend. And my first instinct was, well, when are you going to get married? Because you can't be a Christian and live with your boyfriend. And, you know, marriage was on the table for her and, and everything. But, but the thing is, is I, was, I had it backwards. I had it all backwards and upside down. Because Jesus, Jesus saves, not those actions. There's a quote that's, that is often attributed to Wesley or Phineas Brzee, but um, most historians think it's from Augustine. And, and he's talking about, about religion, and it's an essentials unity, and the non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. We often want to get caught up on what we think is essential. We we have a list of, you know, five miles long about the essential doctrines of the faith and the essential things that we need to repent of and, and all this stuff. But you know what? There's only one essential listed in Scripture. Believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's it. That is it. It says in Acts 16, where Jason just finished preaching, when the prison guard asked Paul and Silas, how do I, how do I become saved? And, and he, they reply, believe in, in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 
Now, if you want to get a little bit more detail there, in Romans 9, or 10, verse 9, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But really, what does that boil down to? Jesus Christ is Lord. You can't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord if you think he's still in the grave. The Lord is alive. <laughs> so, that's the essential. That is what is necessary for salvation. What are the non-essentials? Everything else. Everything else. Physical appearance. I don't care if somebody walks in covered in tattoos, piercings, you know, whatever facial hair design you want, whatever. Barefoot, fully, like, dressed to the nines. I don't care. Doesn't matter. Denomination. I know there are some denominations out there that kind of make us go, ah! But you know what? Those people believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord. Amazing. Political affiliation. This is one that we want to argue about a lot. You can't be saved and vote for that person. How many times have we heard that? How many times have we said that? That's a non-essential. Dietary preferences. I eat meat. You might be vegan. Okay. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. I hope you don't tell me I am, but you know what? If we're going out to dinner together and you're vegan and that's a moral thing that you believe is strong, like, I'll eat a salad. Literally everything besides believing that Jesus Christ is Lord is a non-essential for salvation. We don't need our loved ones to clean themselves up to come to know Christ. You want to know why? Because he's the one that'll do that. And in all things, all things charity, everything. That means before they come to Christ, we are to be conduits of God's grace and not his condemnation. Actually, if we want to get into it, John 3 Right after 16, the verse that everybody knows, comes verse 17 and 18. And it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now, I want to point something out. Jesus does not condemn. It is the sin and unbelief that condemns. So it's not Jesus. And if Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn it, he didn't send us into it either to condemn it. No. We are to be conduits of God's grace and his love in all things. The thing is, is living out freedom looks different when we are with those who are lost versus those who know Jesus. Living out our freedom looks different. When we are with those who are lost, again, we are conduits of God's grace. We meet them where they are. When they have a strong moral compass and a, and a moral stance on something, that they just do not understand how somebody could be a loving person and believe and, and act this way, then maybe we need to stop acting that way when we're witnessing to that person and we're trying to show love to that person. 
like I said, if we go out to lunch and you're a vegan, doesn't matter how much I like that bacon cheeseburger, because it's, it is something that you strongly believe is wrong and that you can't understand how somebody who loves God as much as I do could do that, I will eat that salad. I, might eat, I, I will eat that bacon cheeseburger another day. I'm not going to stop eating meat just because, <laughs> but I will eat that, I, I'll eat that another day. When we are with those who are lost, sometimes we need to put our freedoms on hold. But we extend freedom to those who are saved so that they may freely live out their faith in Christ. And this is another area where we sometimes get caught up on things. I, uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this story because a little harsh. It's a hard story, one that breaks my heart even now. Um, when I was eight years old, I was, well, seven, I was placed in foster care. And uh, my first foster home, there was this young lady um, we, we became really close. We were like two months apart in age, so we, like, we were really close. We had the same class and everything. Uh, and we, we attended the same church, obviously, because we were in the same foster home. There was this gentleman at our church, and he was a, he was a really great old, old man, like really, well, really wonderful old man, but he had this very strong belief that girls shouldn't wear pants. They should wear dresses. And, you know, that didn't bother me at all. I love dresses. I was that little girl that when I was five years old, I wore a big frilly princess dress, and I sat down in the mud puddle and made mud pies. I loved dresses, but I was also pretty messy. But I, I had no problem wearing dresses. I loved dresses. But this other young lady... There's a reason she was put in foster care. You see, before she was placed in foster care, her father would make her wear dresses because it provided easy access for assault. And any time she wore, a, wore pants to that church, this gentleman would get on her case and say that she was dressing too masculine. And her foster mother, in an attempt to appease this old gentleman, would make her wear a dress. I don't think she fully understood the trauma. Honestly, it was only recently that I fully understood how bad that trauma was. But that young lady, at 12 years old, shortly after I had been adopted into another home, that young lady had a mental breakdown. She had no safe place to go because her church, where it should have been a safe place and a place of healing, was a place that triggered her trauma because she had to wear a dress. And her home, her, I mean, her foster mother put made her wear a dress to church. And we might not think, from the outside looking in, we might not think that's, that that's a big deal. You know, yeah, little girls should dress girl, like feminine. Like, we might think that. We might think that, you know, we have these expectations of, of people and, and how people should appear at church on Sunday morning. But sometimes those expectations will bind people in chains that, they, that Jesus wants to free them from. I don't know what happened to that friend of mine. 
After 12 years old, when she had a mental breakdown, she was sent to a group home, and I never heard from her again. I hope that she found Jesus. I hope that she found freedom. But what breaks my heart the most is that I was a Christian, someone who had found freedom in Christ that had bound her up so much that the church was no longer safe for her. So as Christians, we extend freedom because we don't know. We don't know what other people have gone through. We don't know what God has freed them from. We don't know what God has healing them from. So we must not bind people in chains of our own convictions because that's all they are, their convictions. And they're personal. And there's a reason they're personal. It's because it's for me. This is a way that I love Jesus better. Not a way for me to force you into a mold of my making. <laughs> Sorry. So let's not use our freedom as a means to bind our brothers and sisters. Our freedom is meant to be used to help others find freedom. Whether that's freedom from the sin that they are that is holding them captive or freedom from a legalistic mindset that is holding them back from seeking Jesus because they think that they're already okay. But it's still, we are still meant to help them find freedom. And when we pray the prayer that so many of us pray when we have a lost loved one, where we say, God, use whatever means necessary, may that be a prayer of surrender. because maybe we're the means necessary. And maybe the means necessary is us putting our personal issues aside. And just loving them. And showing them the love and freedom that is found in Christ. And understanding that there's one essential, just one. That is that they believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of their life. And if Jesus Christ is Lord of their life, then Jesus Christ will do the work that is needed in their lives to set them free from the chains that are holding them. Whether that be alcoholism, any other addiction, pornography, whatever it is, God will deal with that. Our job is to be conduits, just tools of his grace and his mercy and his love. You and I really have no idea what the person across the table is going through. That person that sits next to us every day, that journeys through life with us, yeah, we might be enduring a situations together. Or you may, they may be enduring a situation that you've been through before. But we all carry different bag, baggage into those moments, into those things. And we all react differently because each and every one of us is different. Because, and that's the way God made us. So our best tool as followers of Jesus, the thing that can make us the most effective witness for the kingdom of God, is showing empathy for our neighbor. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Burt Passman Podcast. It was recorded live at the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene, located at 530 Main Street in Ravenna, Kentucky. You can learn more about the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene by visiting ravnaz.com. 
If you'd like to send me a message, just simply use the link in the show notes. 